What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pats podcast. I'm Phil Perry. We have a very special edition of Next Pats for you this week because we're bringing on our buddy Ty Dunn, who is, in my opinion, one of the best when it comes to covering the sport, reporting, writing. He's been at Bleacher Report. He's been at the Buffalo News. He's been at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. He has been across the country covering this great game for a long, long time now. But he has his first book that is coming out October 18th. It's called The Blood and Guts, How Tight Ends save football you're going to want to get your hands on this specifically if you are a patriots fan because there are two patriots that are detailed in this thing with their own chapters ben Coates. if you're of a certain age that gets you fired up because i know it gets me fired up i'm in my mid-30s i grew up watching ben Coates. he was my favorite player drew bledsoe was right there close second okay love drew bledsoe back then but ben Coates was really the guy who got me geeked because he was just so fast, so powerful, so dynamic, caught everything, and just this behemoth of a man who looked like the varsity starter playing against eighth graders at times. He was that special, but also Rob Gronkowski, of course. And you're going to hear from Ty, that re- that chapter that he reported out on Rob Gronkowski sounds like it was one of his favorites, if not his favorite, and you can understand why. The stories are phenomenal, and as I tell him in our interview here, There are a lot of stories in there. As somebody who covered essentially the entirety of Rob Gronkowski's career in New England that even I didn't know. So you're really going to love this thing. Let's get to our conversation with Ty Dunn and all things tight ends right now. There he is, our friend Ty Dunn, author of The Blood and Guts, How Tight Ends Save Football. Ty, thanks so much for being with us here on Next Pants, man. We're really excited to talk about this book with you. Hell yeah, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, we'll get into it. These Patriots, they came up again and again and again. And it was so much fun hanging out with Ben Coates, getting to know Rod Gronkowski, talking to him. Uh, just thrilled to be here, Phil. Good to see you again. Well, it's great to see you. It's always fun to chat with you about all things football. You are one of the best in the country when it comes to writing about this sport. That's why I'm so excited to get my hands on this book. I've had the good fortune of being able to read a little bit of it ahead of time. This thing comes out on October 18th. So as Ty mentioned, if you want your Ben Coates nostalgia, if you want your Rob Gronkowski party stories and throwing people out the club stories, this book is for you, but it spans really the history of the NFL and why this position is so important. That's where I want to start with you because you have written the tight end is the sport itself distilled into one position. I love that line. Why do you feel that way? Right. The game is changing. The game is softening. The NFL is on this quest to find a middle ground that does not exist. We lose our minds every weekend. I mean, it's, I'd like to thank the 32 owners and Roger Goodell for, you know, trying to create this overly sanitized, product in week five of the NFL season right before this book comes out because it makes us all lose our minds and that that's the whole purpose of the book I mean I'm an old soul when it comes to the sport love the violence love the physicality love real football and it'd be nice if the NFL was honest with itself and acknowledged that this is what the game is and I mean do we want people decapitating receivers in the middle of the field no you know you know it when you know it right with with how it goes too far but the tight end position, man, until you make it flat, until you make it touch, you block, you go out for routes, you catch the ball, and it really lends itself to the most, you know, iconic, outlandish, fun personalities in the sport. I mean, Shannon Sharp, Rob Gronkowski, George Kittle, Tony Gonzalez, all these guys were just, just a riot at this position. And it's not a coincidence. People are going to find out why exactly this position lends itself to that, that real football, that real violence, yet also that authenticity that we just cannot get enough of. That's intoxicating. That's why we all fell in love with Rob Gronkowski. It really is such a great point about how the game is changing because this position is changing too. And it feels like year after year, we hear Bill Belichick or others at the podium say, you know, the, the big name tight end X that we'll be seeing this week. He's really more receiver than he is a true tight end because, you know, Bill Belichick loves the original nature of that position. You know, having been on teams with, you know, Mark Bavaro or even before in his Detroit days, they used the two tight end packages there that uh, he eventually 
both with the Patriots and with other Bill Belichick related teams, they still call their 12 personnel packages, one back, two tight ends. They still call those Detroit. That goes all the way back to when Bill Belichick tried to encourage the use of two tight ends. So, you know, he loves this, this tight end position. Do you feel like the old blood and guts that is this position is going to be able to sustain given all the changes that we're seeing in the sport tie? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and Gronk is really the dude and, you know, by proxy, Bill Belichick to identify Rob Gronkowski. I can tell you, when people read this book, Bill Belichick comes up again and again and again. He knew how dangerous, how potent the tight end could be in the run game of the past game. Um, before anybody he was at the cutting edge of that. I mean, even Ben Coates is early in his career. Bill Belichick's just beating the hell out of him when he's in Cleveland. You know, he's sending all his linebackers, two, three guys, just knocking him off the line because he knew Ben Coates had all started with, with him. So you fast forward, he identifies Rob Gronkowski. He, he knows that this is a, a rare weapon. And I, I do think that Rob Gronkowski came around at the perfect time. And I talked to Rob about this at length where 2010, 2011, 2012, that's really when the flags started flying, you know, to a different degree. And the fines. I remember covering the Green Bay Packers at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And every week, you know, these DBs are losing their minds. And they don't even know where to hit, where to tackle. Even the receivers are saying, hit, hit me high. I don't want to get hit low. It was just the confusion started setting in then. Um, and look, a lot is justified with what we learned about concussions, league of denial, groundbreaking journalism. I'm not taking it away from that. There, there's a lot of good that comes with awareness, but the overcorrection has been insane. And the overcorrection really started to set in in the Gronk era. So here you drop in the six foot six, whatever he is, 265, 270, absolute freak of a conquistador, like seeking out helpless DBs, blasting through them. You read it, you know, well, hey, we got to give your listeners a taste. Like there's a dude in college that ran into Gronk. You know, he's trying to kill Gronk and just bounces off of Gronk. And his career basically ends the, the next year because of that concussion. It's crazy. Um, Sergio Brown, all sorts of stories in there about Gronk basically just blasted through the sport of football in every conceivable way. And that physicality was needed at that time. I feel like the sport needed Rob Gronkowski right when the sport was becoming something else that wasn't football. And we loved him for it. Everybody did. And then really George Kittle took the mantle, took the baton from, from Rob Gronkowski and continued on um, his play style. You know, he, he, he loves to block at Iowa. He, he really learned to fall in love with that aspect of the position. So I, I get the criticism of tight ends, like Kyle Pitts, to call him a tight end. Eh, it's, you know, he's evolving the position and it's great what you can do in the pass game. But I feel like the preservation of the sport is best seen in that tight end who's willing to roll up the sleeves and kick a little ass. This is how you know Ty is one of the best football writers we have. You don't just have to take my word for it, but you know I started covering this team in 2011. So it was the year after Rob Gronkowski was drafted and covered his entire career here in New England, was right there in the locker room, got to know the guy really well. You know, but you do such a great job of capturing his personality and capturing these details and these moments in his career that I knew nothing about. You know, I'm sitting here thinking I'm the I'm an expert on Rob Gronkowski and I'm reading what you sent me before the book comes out here on what you have on Rob Gronkowski. And I'm riveted because I don't even know about a lot of this stuff. So I know this book is chock full of those kinds of details. So Ty, hit us with your favorite Rob Gronkowski story. And then for people my age who grew up watching Ben Coates, you mentioned him already and just how how valuable Bill Belichick saw him as an opposing coach. That guy was such a monster and he was so fun to watch. And that connection between Drew Bledsoe and Ben Coates really made that Patriots offense to me as a kid worth watching and just watching this giant human being running up and down the field and outrunning guys <laughs> and running over guys and catching everything thrown his way. So give us your favorite Gronk story and your favorite Ben Coates story for those of us that are just going to just, just luxuriate in the nostalgia that comes along with <laughs> envisioning Ben Coates and those giant flying Elvis heads on the shoulder pads. I couldn't believe how fast he was early in his career. He's just running away from the Buffalo Bills defense on his first touchdown. It's, it's freaky. Uh, but well, let's start with where you started, Rob Gronkowski. I don't even, man, it is hard to pick one, but we got to do it right. We got to 
leave some breadcrumbs to the book. Hopefully people can just go around to Amazon, buy the blood and guts. I'll bring it back to where I live, right here in Buffalo, New York. This, this is where the Gronkowski legend was born. And I'm going to say it was probably, you know, uh, one, one story, we'll, we open the chapter with this. He's, he's playing with his brother, his younger brother, and they're fighting over a fight from earlier in the day. You know, they beat each other up in mini sticks hockey. It was constant battles in their basement. You know, all, all the grunks going at it. And they're playing with pogs, right? In the, remember the 90s, playing with pogs, with slammers, you know, going at it there. All of a sudden, Rob just sprints to the bathroom, right? You get a, you get a quick shot in. He gets a shot in on Glenn, his younger brother, and he retreats to the bathroom. That was the move for the Gronkowskis. That's where you would just take shelter after you got a shot in. Yet, as he gets to the bathroom, in comes Glenn Goose, and he blasts through the door, hits the door, goes flying, hits his head on the bathtub, and he's out cold. He's blacked out. And his brother thinks, what the hell just happened is, is Rob conscious? Is he unconscious? Is he dead? At some point, he's sitting there. He's like, do I call the police? What do I do? And then a few seconds later, three, two, one, here comes Rob Gronkowski blasting through and gets his revenge on his brother. So, um, yeah, it was it was a different lifestyle for the Grocks. I mean, I grew up in Elkville, New York. You know, there's a ski resort. It's about an hour south of Buffalo. And, I mean, you hear stories about the Gronkowskis there where he Forget the bunny hill. When he the first time he put skis on, he went to one of the most difficult hills and just flew down. You know, no, no fear. He had zero fear. He lived like there was no tomorrow. He played like there was no tomorrow. No tomorrow. He partied like there was no tomorrow. I Maybe mean, we've got the walk and flock of flame party stories in there. Uh, after they won the AFC championship, I want to say it was 2014. James Devlin had a hilarious story. They went to Grox Place there in Massachusetts, and you know he's the fullback is there with his wife to be. And it was like strobe lights and DJs and drinks and madness. And he said, <laughs> you know, he don't know, he doesn't know who it was. One of Rob's friends from the Buffalo days, not a brother. He said it wasn't a brother. Just comes up to his his girlfriend at the time and just starts doing the party boy, you know, the <laughs> just grinding up on. Her. He's like, what the hell? Get out of here! He had to meet him. Um, yeah, it was it was a riot. I, from that chapter, that Rob Gronkowski chapter, I. I don't know what it came in at, like 10, 11,000 words. I feel like it could have been 30, 40,000. I didn't want it to end. Like talking to all these guys, Julian Edelman had some wild stories as well. It, it was a riot. And uh, he he is, you know, the, the play style speaks for itself, right? The way he just would run over everybody and just cream anything in, in his path. And uh, I think the Sergio Brown, you know, rivalry will kind of bring that to life and throw him out of the club. We talked to Sergio Brown and he, he still wishes he would have just turned it, turned it into an all-out brawl that night. But I think it's that authenticity. The fact that, you know, here we have this preconceived notion of like Bill Belichick is sucking the fun out of the game. You know, if, if you play for Bill Belichick, if you play for the Patriots, you're a robot. You're just a cog in a machine. Um, it de he's dehumanizing athletic competition. And Rob Gronkowski just is, you know, there is nothing in life more authentic than Rob Gronkowski and Bill Belichick let him be himself. Like he knew Rob needed to be Rob and he didn't interfere with that, which says a lot about Bill Belichick says a lot about Rob Gronkowski. And I think that the fact that Rob was so successful being himself, right. With all the antics, all the party and everything, it, it saved football in a, in a lot of ways because, you know, Belichick's assistants go everywhere. They try to bring this de dehumanizing robot approach up and it doesn't work. They don't win. So it just, that's a myth. <laughs> Bill Belichick is the damn good coach. And the Patriots just want a hell of a lot of Super Bowls because they're really, really talented. Um, I, th that, I think that's what I love most about Rob Gronkowski. He's proof that you can be yourself and kick everybody's ass doing it. And he probably, I would imagine, just based on what we know of Bill Belichick's approach as a coach, right? I think he probably helped Bill, Bill Belichick understand the modern day athlete a little bit better and probably changed how he treated players from Gronk on after. Now, Gronk is a, a rare specimen, right? And he's a Hall of Fame player. And so you're going to end up treating those guys differently. But the personality and what he needed in terms of how to get him to be as motivated as he could be and, and know what buttons to push, you know, they were not always totally 
simpatico, those two, but I think it probably helped Bill Belichick evolve in terms of his understanding of the players that now reside in his locker room versus the guys who were there, say, when he was in Detroit in 1975. It's just a different type of personality, and there are some different, I think, qualities that a coach requires to be able to get through to those guys. And you started covering the team in 2011, you said, right, Phil? So that was the Super Bowl season. That's when Rob Gronkowski is at the Super Bowl party after a loss. On the you know at, after he was I don't even know what percent he was playing in that game. You know he was not himself. He was a shell of himself with that injury, and yet he's popping the top. He's dancing. He's dancing all over the place with his brothers. He catches a ton of criticism. I feel like every Patriot legend publicly was was bashing Rob Gronkowski for having fun after a Super Bowl loss like that. That's just Rob. I mean, he's not gonna he's not gonna wallow in self pity. He's not. He was sad and he was hurt by the Super Bowl loss, but he's just a fun loving dude. But I think that that off season was such a such a huge off season and everything we're talking about. Where you know after that criticism, Rob Gronkowski could have just shut down and gone into a shell. That's you see it all the time. A player says something, um, you know, opinionated in the media or has a take and is honest and they're, they're killed on Twitter. They're, they're killed on all the talk shows and then they become a robot. They don't say anything. And here's a guy who played for Bill Belichick in New England on the biggest stage. You know, that's the number one storyline out of that game. He didn't change, right? He didn't, hell no, he's not going to go in a shell. Hell no, he's not going to be somebody else. That was the summer of Gronk. <laughs> that's when he really ramped it up and was at all of these parties and having the time of his life. And he never turned back from that. So, I think that it says a lot about who he is and um, Bill Belichick and the Patriots. And it comes back to, they knew what they had in Rob Gronkowski. They knew that this was a tight end who, yeah, yeah, he might, he might go partying, but he, a lot like Jeremy Shockey, the tight end that he looked up to and idolized and wrote a letter to back when he was a kid in Buffalo, he'd almost punish himself, right? He, he'd feel guilty. If he, if he partied, had a good time. That next morning, he's doing P90X workouts with his brothers. Like he's he's working the sweat up. He, he's and in a weird way, all that party, and he really thinks it it helped him. It was a workout because he's he's not drinking beers, you know. He's having a little vodka water and he's dancing constantly. You know, it's maybe it wasn't the best dance, and he thought it looked good, but it was a workout. So in a weird way, it kind of helped him. He he really thinks it helped him. And uh, I think Bill Belichick got that. I think he got Rob Gronkowski, and he knew that it wasn't only that. It was he's a smart player. How many receivers have come through New England, and they can't get on the same page as Tom Brady, Chad Ochocinco, Joey Galloway? It's really good wide receivers. They can't run that option route. They don't see what Tom Brady sees. Um, Rob Gronkowski and, and Tom Brady were intellectually on their own level. So, all that being said, why would you tell Rob Gronkowski to live any other way? All right, so Ty. You got to give us something on Ben Coates here. What did what stood out to you? You know, the, the reporting on on all of these guys is so in depth, and you're tracking these guys down to tell their stories and tell the wild stories like the Waka Falaka Flame Party with Rob Gronkowski. But there's so much humanity in your reporting too, and, and empathy, especially for some of these older guys. What did you think, and what stood out to you most when you got into the Ben Coates story? So we're hanging out at his home in North Carolina. And I think initially what stands out is he's a hermit compared to all of these other tight ends. Like Shannon Sharp's yapping with Skip Bayless. Tony Gonzalez is an actor. He's on TV as a broadcaster. Gronk is Gronk. Kittle is Kittle. You know, Greg Olson's on TV. All, all these other tight ends. Jeremy Shockey is a beast in his own category. And we don't hear from Ben Coates. He doesn't really care. Like he's he kind of scoffs at the fact that there's players that feel their need to shed tears to get into the hall of fame. He's like, yeah, you'll never see me do that. I'm never going to start a campaign to get into Canton. Uh, I, that's admirable to me. It, so it was a little tougher to get. Uh, once we connected, he's like, yeah, fly on down. We'll, we'll hang out right at the house. And I think what stood out most with Ben Coates is he's in a world of hurt right now. Um, he is God. I mean, I, I had, I was rejogging my memory before popping on here. I mean, his elbows, he's got like pointy elbows. He's got bursitis. His fingers are mangled. He dislocated a thumb in a game, put a cast on and played. The AstroTurf, it was like playing on concrete, right? These guys in the 90s, it was so bad. I think one of his fraternity brands cut open. He had to stitch that back up. Once he got hit, his helmet shoved in a different direction, a little piece of metal 
like just caught him. He's bleeding everywhere. Didn't even know he was bleeding until the teammate told him. Um, severely, he only missed two games, right, in a decade. One game was because he had a severely sprained high ankle, which keeps guys out for weeks, if not months. Missed one game. Um, and the other was when his mom died. I mean, this is somebody who was constantly in survival mode. Um, every game, every practice, you know, took a little offense, I think, that Bill Bar- Parcells and the Patriots were constantly drafting tight ends through the 90s. It was like they were trying to replace this guy from tiny Livingstone College again and again. And I think that that, that, that fueled Ben Coates a little bit. And uh, it, it, the roots of it all, he's the son of a World War II vet. He grew up basically on the roofs of houses, uh, building, it, you know, installing roofs with his dad, with his brothers. Uh, and we're not talking about no electric nail gun. I mean, it is with a hammer. It's throwing shingles on your shoulder, climbing up the ladder. If it was really steep like this, they had to nail in a two by four board just to keep them in place. And that was his life from age seven to age 20. Ben Coates living on a roof of a house, installing this all, um, you know, for, for quote unquote fun, he's just jumping off, you know, it, it's a different life. I mean, it's, and his brothers, I mean, they went off to fight wars in the Middle East. We, we hung out, God, shortly after we just handed Afghanistan back to the Taliban last year. And I was like, Ben, like, are your brothers worried about anything at our brothers? No. A lot like Robert Murkowski, no fear. And he played with no fear. All of that is the reason he, he played tight end, the reason he helped revolutionize the position. We don't talk about Ben Coates nearly enough, but he had as much to do with the preservation of football, real football, as any tight end in the NFL through the 90s. It's amazing. We've been so fortunate, those of us that have been in this area, to watch the, the tight ends that we have over the last few decades. I mean, those are those are two of the best to ever do it. They're covered in such great detail in your book. Before we let you go, though, Ty, we have to ask you about the modern-day situation here in Foxborough. Two tight ends. The Patriots throw all kinds of money at it. Not this past off season, but two off seasons ago. Hunter Henry, Jonu Smith. Okay, here it comes, the resurgence of 12 personnel, you know, just like in the early 2010s that you were talking about there with Rob Gronkowski and Aaron Hernandez. We know how productive those guys were. It hasn't worked out. And Jonu Smith's hurt right now, but Hunter Henry just had his best game as a Patriot, and the numbers were relatively pedestrian, uh, you know, for this year. At least last year, he was really productive, had nine touchdowns, tied for the league lead at that position. But it just never came to fruition the way the team was anticipating being able to use both these guys on the field at the same time. So now that we have the foremost expert on tight ends in the NFL with us here on Next Pats, what do you think has happened here? Why why has this maybe not worked out the way everybody anticipated it could? You know what, Phil? I bet you that the failure for that two tight end set to really take off probably pains Bill Belichick more than anything. Um, He is such a force of nature behind the scenes on, on the tight end position and where and, and how it became what it did from the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s to today. Um, I just definitely, everybody out there, please pre-order the blood and guts. We've got the full story in that 2010 draft when, you know, you draft Rob Gronkowski, you draft Aaron Hernandez. Well, there were some other tight ends in that draft, Jimmy Graham being one of them. And let's just say Bill Belichick had an inkling, had, had a notion about Jimmy Graham a year before that. I mean, he wanted Jimmy Graham a year before. He tried to convince this basketball player to hey, hang out on our practice squad for a year. So I don't know if there's another coach when it comes to the tight end position who was as cutting edge as Bill Belichick. So for him to pay up for two tight ends, I mean, they paid a pretty penny for Hunter Henry and John Smith. And for just kind of be bleh, I, I, I'm sure it, it's keeping him up at night. I'm sure it's ticking him off. I'm sure he wishes that you know, that's really what the bread and butter for this team was. And I think that when they paid all that money last offseason for all these players, that was, you know, central to it all is we're going to run the ball and we're going to work work with these tight ends off for the run and do some really creative things. Maybe they still turn a corner. I mean, I love the fact that they're just running power, you know, getting north and south, old school football. Not, a lot of teams are running the ball a lot, but it's with wide zone. It's Shanahan. It's McVay. It's. You know, the D linemen are, are kind of playing a few gaps when Bill Belichick is saying, no, we're going to put a hat on the hat. We're going to force your D linemen to beat our O linemen and we're going to run it down your throat. Um, love that kind of football. The tight ends play a huge part in that kind of football. So 
I'm the last person that's going to bail on the New England Patriots and Bill Belichick. I think there's plenty of time for them to turn it around. I'm sure that the, the, the tight ends are not really turning that corner and becoming the most dynamic one-two punch that make this offense go. I'm t- I, bet, I bet you it drives Belichick nuts. Well, and they can be such great security blankets for quarterbacks, right? They end up getting both these guys before they draft Mac Jones, but they knew they were going to be getting a new quarterback. And now Mac Jones is hurt. You would think Bailey Zappi, third string rookie, is in there now trying to make things happen for them. You would think that these two guys would be able to maybe just help advance their development a little bit more quickly, as a number of these guys in your book, I'm sure we're able to do for myriad quarterbacks for decades, right? I mean, it's just, you just think about all the big plays that happen off of dump offs that these great, great athletes. Drew Bledsoe, right? I mean, Drew Bledsoe, we, we talked about that at length. It was, I mean, he needed Ben Coates. And he goes, I'm not ashamed to admit it. He was my security blanket. Like I just looked for 87 and it didn't matter what play was called in from Bill Parcells. I, I'm going to him. <laughs> so it's huge. I'm sure. Yeah. And that, that had to have been a massive reason to, pay up for these tight ends and like I said let's give it a little time let, let, let's see how it pans out there is still time there is still time so it could end up working out for the Patriots there's also still time for you right now to go and order Ty Dunn's book the blood and guts this is the ultimate book on tight ends how tight ends save football Ty thanks so much for being with us that thing is out again October 18th but you can go over to Amazon right this second pre-order that thing that's right make sure it's headed to your house as soon as humanly possible. Ty, thanks so much for being on with us, telling us about the book, man. This was awesome. You're the man, Phil. Thanks so much for the opportunity. And, and you know, let me chat with all of your Patriots fans listening. So thanks so much. Great stuff there from Ty. Always good to get him here on the next Pats podcast, talking about what is next at the tight end position across the NFL. Is it Kyle Pitts or is it, Somebody more like a Rob Gronkowski, who I think has really opened up the door for guys like George Kittle. Maybe he should have swung it open even more because Kittle somehow slides all the way to the fifth round. And he doesn't necessarily have the frame of somebody like Rob Gronkowski, but the guy can block. The guy can catch. He's dynamic after the catch. That's what you should be looking for at that tight end position. Kyle Pitts may end up being a great player. He really is a receiver right now. And I think he could do a little bit of the blocking. And maybe as he grows into that position, he grows into being a pro and getting accustomed to what it takes physically at the NFL level. Maybe you see him used a little bit more in tight end situations, but he's really a receiver. And maybe that's where things end up going more and more because of changes to the college game and things getting more spread out there. And maybe you see more 10 personnel at the college game with one back and no tight ends, four receivers on the field. And maybe that eventually trickles up to the NFL, but it's clear Ty, and I feel the same way, believes that there will always be a place for these true dual threat tight ends who can do both because they are such dangerous weapons if they can do both. And the Patriots, they thought they had two of these in Hunter Henry and Jonu Smith. And as Ty mentioned, too early just yet to completely write them off This is a new Patriots offense this year in 2022. They did work extremely hard over the summer to try to figure out ways to use both of these players on the field at the same time, whether it's Hunter Henry in line and John U. Smith on the wing or in the slot or vice versa. Both can do both. John U. Smith probably thought of across the league as the better blocker, but Hunter Henry is no slouch necessarily in that regard. And the Patriots use him that way. They trust him to come across the line of scrimmage on wham plays and take on interior linemen on the defensive side of the ball. And that's not the best matchup for him, but they believe he can do it. And when it comes to blocking safeties or corners or off the ball linebackers, he can certainly hold his own. As far as that goes, I think back to the wide zone touchdown run that Damian Harris had in green Bay ends up being a big play in that game. And the Patriots have been so good at running the football the last two weeks, especially, but on that play in particular, you got wide zone going to the left. Damian Harris cuts it all the way back to the right. And who makes one of the key blocks at the second level for that touchdown? It's Hunter Henry. So he can get that part of the job done. So too can Jonu Smith, in my opinion. They're not dominating blockers. They're not necessarily moving people the way a Rob Gronkowski did. 
but they can get it done. And then as receivers, both are very capable. Johnny Smith, we know he's a yards after catch machine, or at least he had been prior to his arrival here in New England. And Bill Belichick praised him as one of the best in the league when he was still with the Titans prior to signing with the Patriots in that regard. Yards after catch, yak, monster. Hunter Henry, crafty, understands how to get open, not maybe the most explosive athlete, but very sure hands, understands concepts, understands defenses. That's part of the reason when things get condensed, things get tight in the red zone, he can be really productive. Nine scores last year with Hunter, with, excuse me, Mac Jones behind center. And with the Patriots really struggling in the red zone, they went 0 for 4 against a really abysmal Lions defense in week five. They went 0 for 4 in the red zone. Getting Hunter Henry more involved has to be a priority. It's really fun to talk to Ty about where the Patriots sit with those positions right now. And maybe they're at it as we speak. We're recording this on Wednesday morning, getting ready for this matchup that they have in Cleveland against the Browns. How can we become more effective in the red zone? And that's something that typically they'll work on on Friday for Friday's practice. But they're putting together the plan right now. It started on Tuesday. It started even before that for some of the coaching staff on Monday. But how can they get more effective in that all-important area, right? They, they do dedicate so much time to it, starting all the way back in training camp. Get those tight ends more involved. And John New Smith may be out another week with the ankle injury he's dealing with, but use that big-bodied frame that Hunter Henry has and allow somebody like Bailey Zappi, who could use all the security blankets he could get if he's playing in Cleveland, allow him the time and space and give him the kinds of concepts that could free up somebody like a Hunter Henry, or make him one of Bailey Zappi's first reads, allow him to see those targets in the end zone. And the results should be something that the Patriots are really happy about. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Next Path Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you could, please, please, please rate, comment, subscribe. If you want to leave a question in the Apple Podcast comments section of Next Paths, we'll be diving into that stuff if you want to hit us with a question on Twitter as well, at Phil A. Perry for one of our mailbags, we'll be getting into those next week on Next Pats. Lots to get to each and every week. We've got some great guests that are going to be lined up for the remainder of this month in October and into November as the Patriots really hit an all-important stretch of their schedule. This is where they need to start rattling off wins to get to where they want to be by season's end. Can they do it? We'll have you covered here. Thanks again to to Tyler Dunn for talking to us about his book, The Blood and Guts. It's out on October 18th. It's about how tight ends save football. We all love football, right? Ty loves it. I love it. If you're listening to this podcast, you love it too. You're going to love that book. Go check it out. Thanks again, guys. We'll talk to you next week.